Today we're presenting Compliance in the World of HR. My name is Ronnie Freeman. I'm in business development here at Partners Human Resources. Today's agenda, we're going to have our payroll processing pointer. It's going to be about minimum wage. We're going to also have our safety minute about fire prevention. Then we'll get to our main topic, which is compliance in the world of HR. We'll have a Q&A. And then if you have questions as we go along, please type them in the chat box. And we'll be pausing in between and answering questions. I'd like to introduce to you for our payroll processing pointer today, Sean Owen. Sean is one of our administrative service specialists. I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be speaking today about something pretty important having to do with payroll, the federal minimum wage. Before I get started, I just want to say uh, Partners does not want to take a stance on whether you know, what minimum wage should be or shouldn't be. It's just to make you aware of some of the current rules and regulations pertaining to minimum wage. Our first bullet point, uh, federal minimum wage is $7.25 per hour. This covers non-exempt employees and it's paid for all hours worked up to 40 hours per week. Anything over 40 hours would be paid as overtime. Now, keep in mind, a given work week is, is seven full days. So anything over seven days would, anything over 40 hours in a seven day work week would be considered overtime. Uh, employers can pay on a piece rate a pay basis. And a piece rate basis would be typically something used by construction companies. Uh, this would be uh, maybe like a plumber, for example, the, the piece rate might be an effective tool for a contractor to make sure that they're they're paying based on the number of units that the contractor might complete. So let's take a plumber, for example. Maybe uh, they're doing a remodel or they're working in a building a new business. Uh, they might pay by the number of sinks or faucets that the plumber installs. Uh, but keep in mind, the piece rate must always be the equivalent of required minimum wage for any standard or overtime hours. Our second bullet, minimum wage and the Fair Labor Standards Act. So minimum wage is covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA. Kyle's going to be uh, touching on this a little bit later, so I won't go into too much detail. But just know that uh, the federal law sets the standards for minimum wage. So the FLSA is administered by the Wage and Hour Division of the federal government. The FLSA establishes standards for minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, and child labor. There's more than 130 million Americans protected by the FLSA. And this includes both full-time and part-time employees. Some employees exempt from overtime and minimum wage, but we're not going to get in too much to detail on exempt versus non-exempt. Just know that uh, th there, there are some exemptions there that, that can exclude overtime, but for exact terms and conditions, I think Kyle's going to cover some more of that later, but for exact terms and conditions and questions, you can contact partners and we can help you with that. Um, next, I'd like to speak a little bit about the standard mileage rate. Uh, this is provided to us as a guideline by the IRS. And the IRS sets that rate at 57.5 cents for business mileage. For medical and moving, the rate is set at 23 cents. And for charitable organizations, it's set at 14 cents. The IRS uh, service uh, issues the standard mileage rate each year. And it's commonly used by employers for computing the employee reimbursement amounts when an employee operates a motor vehicle not owned by the employer for the employer's business purposes. It's based on an annual study and a fixed variable cost of operating an automobile. This is an optional rate that the IRS posts each year. And it's just used as a guideline most employers uh, 
can pay under or over this rate. Um, but again, it, it is based on a study that the IRS does, and it's based on variable costs such as gas and oil. The charitable rate that we mentioned is the only rate that is set by law. Uh, in closing, I, I want to talk a little bit about a, a fun fact. Uh, this past January, President Obama laid out 12 proposals that will impact payroll. Several of those have to do with more administrative, uh, exempt, non-exempt, and other features. Uh, the most significant proposal in the payroll industry is going to be a raise to the federal minimum wage. The plan would call for a raise of 90, 95 cents per year for the next three years. So this would take minimum wage from where it sits currently to, from 725 to 820, then in the next year to 915, and finally finishing at $10.10. The big issue here is not so much the value, but it is the implementation. Um, just know that Partners is monitoring this and will keep you apprised of any changes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. If you need more information, you can call Sean at 405-917-1020 and ask for Sean, or you can see his email address there on the screen, owens at partners-hr.com. I'd like to take a moment to ask anybody that uh, has not muted their phone, please mute the phone for us, and then we'll continue on. Oh, I see a, a question here, Ronnie. Is the question is around if your employer does not reimburse up to the 57.5 cents IRS standard, what uh, what impact does that have uh, on on the individual? John. Um, Again, the, the, the mileage rate is set as an optional pay. It's a guideline more so that the IRS issues. So if, if, you, if you're paying over and you see that as an employer, the employee can simply, uh, if he's paid over or paid under, can handle that on his taxes at the end of the year. Um, that would be what we would advise. Again, it's, it's an optional pay rate that the IRS comes up with that's based on a study of different things from the, the price of gasoline to the price of an oil change and obviously different prices in different states. So it's hard to just nail down a fixed price. But just know again, if, if, you, if you do pay over or under, that something can be handled on taxes by the individual at the end of the year. Thank you, Sean. All right, looking to see if we have any more chat questions. And I don't see any right now. Please chime in any time that you need to. We'll make sure we get the uh, experts to answer this for you. Next, we want to turn to Ron Wofford. He's our Director of Risk Management here at Partners Human Resources with our Safety Minute. Today's Safety Minute is about fire prevention. Hello, everybody. First thing you need to know to stay safe is what does your fire alarm sound like? Is it audible? Is it visual? Or is it both? We don't have fire drills as much as we probably should, like we did when we were in grade school. So if you don't have that set up as a normal function in your facility, uh, I might add that you could uh, add that to your monthly or annual uh, safety drills in your facility. Make sure you know where the exits are to get out of your facility. Uh, in case one may be blocked, you may need to find an alternate route out. Uh, make sure that you have these posted at home in case you have visitors in your facility. What equipment, if any, should be shut off on your way out? Where to go once you're safely outside the building? Have a meeting place. Have rosters with those employees so that you can count for everybody. and. Let the fire personnel know if somebody did not make it out and what, what position that they may be in uh, in the building. In case of a fire, first thing you do is call 911. Start the evacuation of the building by setting off the fire alarm if it hasn't already been activated on its own. Only fight the fire to what extent you've been trained. Don't want to put anybody in uh, undue harm. 
Always have a safe escape route to exit your uh, exit to your rear. Don't get trapped by the fire. Remember to be aware that heat from the fire can incapacitate you. Smoke can overwhelm you. Toxic vapors from chemicals or grease in the plant can suffocate you. Explosions can send debris flying in every direction. You can come in contact with electrical lines once the uh, building starts to come apart. To help prevent fire, store on and dispose all chemicals in instructed uh, type containers labeled with MSDS sheets available. Only smoke in designated areas. Most buildings nowadays are smoke-free environments, so that area should be outside the building. Report to maintenance any equipment with frayed or damaged wires or cords. Keep your work area free of grease, flammable chemicals or solvents and oils. Make sure access to emergency response equipment is kept clear, such as fire extinguishers. To evacuate in the event of a fire or chemical release, go out to the nearest unblocked exit. During an earthquake, which Oklahoma has been having here recently, uh, find a stable structure such as a door frame, stand under, stay there until the event is over, then exit through the nearest unblocked exit. In a weather emergency, go to the designated shelter area. We have tornadoes here in Oklahoma. Once you're in the designated meeting place, Make sure that you check with a supervisor or whoever has the checkoff list of all the employees inside. Do not get in your vehicle and leave until you've had an opportunity to make sure that that person knows that you are accounted for and that you're okay. Any questions? Concerns? Ron, it looks like we have one on the chat. How often is it reasonable to get your fire extinguishers checked? Typically, you do a, one, a monthly walkthrough to check off that it, it's in operating order, and then you need to have a uh, company that services those and is certified to give you your annual checkup on all those devices. Thank you. Good question, good answer. Any other questions for our safety guy? Ron, we appreciate it. Next up. At Partners University is Kyle Killingsworth. Kyle has two of the top human resource certifications in the country. He's going to be talking today about compliance in the world of HR and the best practices that, that, there, that are entailed in that. Thanks, Ronnie. Appreciate folks taking the time uh, this week. We had a, another session on Tuesday and doing a final session in August. Uh, today. So thanks for taking your time. And as Ronnie said, we are going to kind of walk through some compliance concerns and you will see quickly that the way this format is set up is just a series of questions that you need to ask yourself, you need to ask others in your organizations around uh, best practices as well as regulatory compliance. Again, if you have questions, uh, enter those in, in the chat box and, and we'll, we'll take those as they come in. Let's start at the beginning. This started at the beginning of the, the uh, whole life cycle of employee, and that has to do with starting with the application process. Application process itself is critical to track uh, for various reasons. Uh, from time to time, you, uh, you may have some type of audit or inquiry from a federal agency. They'll want to see those applications. They'll want to see the applications you've received for the various job openings and postings that you've put out. So let's first talk about what is an application and how do you define an application. Um, just because someone sends you a resume, even an unsolicited resume, or drops by your facility and asks to complete an application, and you may not even have any job openings, or if you do have a job opening, that applicant may not be qualified, uh, then technically one who's not qualified for that role, for that job posting, for that opening, is thus not a candidate. So you would not need to retain 
that application or that resume. You and and our advice here from from Partners HR is to minimize the amount of applications and resumes that you keep uh, and store or put in files. Uh, that just gives a government agency more documents to consider. That gives them more people to consider that maybe should have been considered for that role. And what it will force you to do is explain why, because the burden of proof is on the employer as to why you did not uh, hire that individual. Uh, unsolicited applications, um, when you have openings, or excuse me, when you don't have openings, many organizations will go ahead and accept applications and keep those on file for future openings in that position. It's not necessarily recommended to do that. Again, what we want to do is minimize the amount of applications that we keep on site, minimize the resumes that we're keeping in files, whether that's a paper file or even an electronic file. We want to minimize that so, again, we don't have to answer to any departmental, uh, federal departmental agency around, uh, around that. How long do you keep applications? Those applications that are from qualified candidates meaning those candidates that met the minimum qualifications of, of the uh, job posting, they should be kept for one year if they were considered as a candidate. So the, the, uh, the magic time is one year. And, and after one year, uh, we'd recommend that you go ahead and dispose of those, go ahead and shred those uh, after just one year. Uh, if you keep those applications for a period of time and that job comes open again, many of us go back into that file and review previously received applications. And I'll just leave that up to what works best for you and your business. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, again, I do have a concern about keeping too many applications there and giving the federal government a chance to ask too many questions about it. One thing that you do need to monitor is the sex uh, gender and, and race of your applications, if they're predominantly uh, of one member of gender or race, then you may want to be concerned about your, your recruiting process uh, because it can have a disproportionate negative uh, impact on your business, something else a government agency would be, uh, be interested in. Let's talk a little bit more about the application process. Each qualified applicant should uh, complete a application and all should complete the same application. We should have that as a requirement to complete that standard application so we have that all signed off on in, in the file. Don't just count on a resume for that, but actually utilize an application. I'll pause quickly and see if there's any questions you'd want to ask or type in about that application process. Again, I think the key is to ensure that that candidate is qualified under the minimum requirements for that job before they actually are a candidate and, and, you, and you hold that application. If, you don't, if they're not, then, then our advice is to go ahead and discard that application or resume as technically they were not qualified for that job, this were not considered. Let's, uh, let's move forward and talk about some interviewing processes. It's, it's best practice to have that process standardized and, and, and ensure that it's job related. We encourage uh, those interviewers, those hiring managers to make notes. Uh, if you don't utilize a separate form, then maybe just simply a, a yellow sticky tab on top of that application, make uh, some notes on that. We would not recommend that you make notes on the application itself, but on a separate sheet. Uh, these, uh, these notes can come into play later on if you're ever asked or subject to some type of audit or review. Uh, many times you, individuals can't remember months or even years later as to why they made hiring decisions. Uh, notes would help with that as well as hiring managers that maybe made the decision and are not employed by your organization anymore. So filling up and, uh, and submitting those notes are very important in, in moving forward. Um, it, uh, you, may, you may want to consider, too, training, training the managers on some guidance around those notes and particularly how to conduct those interviews. It's important that those interviews are done in a compliant way 
regarding the types of questions which can and shouldn't be asked of an applicant. If you need some help in training or some guidelines, again, reach out to uh, Partners HR, uh, to resources here, and we can help guide you in that. We uh, would also uh, advise that your site, your interview site, be accessible for those with disabilities. Uh, if, if you're interviewing for someone that would uh, be out in the warehouse uh, in some form of uh, capacity out there and the only way into that warehouse is up a series of steps, you may want to move that interview into a, a more accessible location uh, just to ensure accessibility to those candidates that, are, that you've called in to, to interview. Let's talk about the selection. Let's talk about the actual selection hiring process. Um, if your selection hiring process is centralized, meaning you've got one person or a couple of people that coordinate that, then it's easier to track and keep up with those applications. If it's somewhat decentralized, there may be multiple locations and you have various managers that are tracking that paperwork, then there needs to be some training and some procedures put in place to ensure that those policies are followed and that that tracking is accurately done. So if you've not considered any training or procedures on that, again, I'll refer you to, to Partners HR to, to, to assist you in getting that established and, and assist in, in training those managers. There's some other uh, processes to consider, and these are optional, but again, are considered best practice in the marketplace. And when I refer to best practices in the marketplace, that's, that just refers uh, to what uh, kind of best of practice cultures do and companies do, uh, and is kind of a bit standard in the marketplace and, and is a commonly accepted practice. So some of those are around records checks. Ask yourself, do we do records checks? Do we do enough of them? And I will tell you, when doing records checks, the worst place to call for a reference check is the HR department or the payroll department, because all you'll get from them is basically the, the uh, time they work there, start date, stop date, and the, the last title that they held. For good reference checks, I ask uh, and suggest that you talk to records. convicted of those assault charges that could be a threat or a risk to your employees and your business. Some other best practices around drug testing, there are regulations under Department of Transportation for those drivers and uh, em uh, employees that are covered under DOT. There's some mandatory drug testing uh, and random drug testing that you'll need to administrate. Um, Pre-employment physicals at times are appropriate, but the key is Whatever you decide to do about best practices, whether it's reference checks, background checks, drug te uh, check testing, whatever that may be, just be consistent with that. Don't treat one job one way and then the next time you have that job opening, uh, treat it in a different way. But be consistent with whatever practice you decide is appropriate for your, for your organization. A few other things just to ask yourself, uh, do we have that handbook available for employees? Are we getting a, a, a signed acknowledgement of that handbook back? Uh, are there other confidentiality agreements, non-disclosure forms that we'd want employees to sign? Get those done up front, meaning on day one during that orientation hiring process. Um, uh, Sean touched on classifications, employee classifications under the Fair Labor Standards Act. This is the exempt versus non-exempt status. Uh, the non-exempt status we primarily recognize as hourly employees. Those hourly employees, as was covered earlier, after 40 hours of work time, they are eligible for overtime at time and a half. The exempt employees, uh, in practice we know, know those as salaried. Those folks are exempt from overtime. In other words, after 40 hours, they would not be receiving overtime. Uh, it, there are some tests that have been set up by the Department of Labor that would 
test the status of an exempt employee and we don't have time to go through, there's about seven of those tests, we don't have time to go through those during this session, but again, if you have questions on that, um, we, can, we can help assist and audit those exempt statuses that you have and apply those questions and, and give you a, an opinion on that. Also, uh, ensure that you've classified workers properly as independent contractors. There's several tests associated with individual, individual or independent contractors. If you utilize contractors and you're questioning whether they're really contractors or employees, again, reach out to Partners HR and let us help with that. Something that um, we all should be doing is completing I-9s for our employees. Technically, you have 72 hours to collect those documents to get uh, th that documented on that I-9 form as well as the uh, W-4s. So those are some things you'll need to ensure that you have uh, in that personnel file and it's best to do that immediately upon, upon hiring when they, when they begin uh, work. A few reasons that we can touch on for why you would pass or, or potentially not hire someone. The real key is around documentation. I come back again to, to documenting on some, on some interview notepad as to why you're passing over this individual on a yellow sticky on the actual application. But again, we can't remember uh, everything that we've done or all the decisions that we made, so to document that and have those notes in place, particularly for situations where a manager may leave that organization, can, can, come, uh, can help a lot during any type of review or audit. Um, I think the other thing of note is you've got uh, a couple of the government agencies noted on the slide, the EEOC and the OFCCP, who encouraged uh, internal audits to, to measure uh, any potential discrimination uh, practices. Again, if you need some help with that, we have uh, audits uh, that we can perform from the Partners HR group. Um, and, and Again, what we're talking about are practices. A lot of what we've talked about are not necessarily compliance or regulatory, but are best practices. So whatever makes sense for you and your business, we'd encourage you to, to consider that and, and check that up against the compliance. And again, that's something that the partners group can, can sure help you with. We've had some inquiries around disciplinary procedures. And, and what does that look like compliance-wise? Really. Uh, the rule around discipline is, is around reasonable. We'll, we'll apply the rule of reasonableness around discipline. So if you've adopted a policy or, or if it's not written down, it's just a practice that you follow, what, what the key is to keep in mind as you develop that policy, as you develop those practices, is one what we've talked about before is consistency. That we're consistent with the, with the disciplinary processes from one situation to the next to the next. Um, it also wants to, also needs to be fair. And that's the question around, does the punishment fit the crime? Does it have a sense of fairness to it? If it does, then you're probably going to be OK. The thing that's the key around this is management training. In order to be consistent, in order to follow your policies, the management teams needs to understand what they are and also importantly is how we apply them. So there's usually some training that's required around disciplinary employees to ensure that we are consistent and compliant with our own company uh, policies. And then the documentation. Uh, the first thing that an HR professional asks you when you start to talk to them about discipline, when you start to talk to them um, about taking some disciplinary action, they'll ask you for your documentation. And their, their thought pattern is, if it's not written down, then it probably didn't happen. So it's important to document, even if it's just in a drop file at your desk, any conversations that you've had with employees regarding their performance, any type of attendance issues or tardiness issues. So having those, those documented uh, disciplinary actions in place, whether that's a written warning or some type of verbal reprimand, those need to be part of that individual's personnel file. So it's important that documentation, again, if it's not written down, then it didn't happen. I'll pause just a second uh, to see if we have any questions on 
discipline. We've got one more slide on discipline, but this is one that kind of comes up from time to time. Um, I think we do have one, Kyle. Uh, I think you just answered it. Do you maintain disciplinary forms in the employee's personnel file? Yes, we'll get the form. We'll get to the personnel file in just a minute. They'll, they'll actually be kind of three separate files. This type of action would be recorded directly in that person's uh, what we call personnel file. That would be part of that, along with their application, uh, any other uh, uh, disciplinary processes or general business payroll would, would be part of that. Uh, one question that came up last time, is it mandatory uh, as far as a compliance measure to have a disciplinary process? No, and the answer to that technically is no. You're not required, nor any business is required under any of the acts that we'll look at here in just a minute to maintain a disciplinary process, but it is a recommended practice. In fact, it's recommended that be documented. Most organizations like to reflect that policy in their employee handbook so that employees are made aware up front, this is our policy, these are our procedures when it comes to discipline. But technically, it's not, it's not mandatory. Let's continue on with the slide. Uh, we talked about consistency already. That's always a good thing to check um, in, in when you begin to administer uh, discipline with any particular employee. It's important as well to listen to the employee side. Give them a chance to tell their story. Give them the chance to talk about what happened. It may be something that you've missed in your investigation. It may be something you're not aware of, and it does shed some light. Uh, on the decision that you may uh, you may be making, so so be reasonable about giving them that opportunity. Um, if you if you've got a reoccurring situation in a department, let's say that uh, you've got several folks that are continually late, review and compare those uh, warnings that you're giving those folks to ensure that they're consistent. And then I think also. At times, we think of a disciplinary process as a way to push someone out the door. And actually, I challenge you to consider that as a way to correct that behavior. If they do have an issue, for example, with tardiness, give them an opportunity to correct that behavior. Sometimes there's counseling that can help a correct a person's behavior. Sometimes there's training that can help someone's performance. Because if you can save that employee, uh, move them back into the category of acceptable behavior, back into the category of meeting expectations from a performance perspective, then you don't have to go out to the marketplace and hire an unknown. So think about discipline also as a means to ha help that employee improve in that area of deficiency and not just push them out the door. In a another disciplinary uh, state and result can, can cause termination. We call this termination for cause. In other words, there was a cause, there was a reason as to why we made the decision to terminate this employee. It's good to have some type of procedure around that. It's good to conduct a thorough investigation before terminating an employee. If you're not sure what a thorough investigation is or looks like, again, I'd encourage you to reach out to partners. Let us help you with that and formulate that procedure, formulate that policy before you take that, that termination action. It's a decision-making process that can help you. One of the most important items is any witness statements. If you're basing a decision on something that someone's told you about that they saw or something that they heard, then that witness statement needs to be documented, meaning it needs to be in writing, part of that investigation file because part of your decision was probably based on what that individual witnessed. And if it's not documented, that individual leaves your organization, some questions come up around that, then you're not going to have the proper uh, documentation in order to back up the claim and even back up your decision as to why you made uh, the decision to let that individual go and to terminate them. We look at the work record of employees. Uh, that's supported in that personnel file. That helps us in that decision-making process that we investigation that we uh, spoke of earlier. Um, is it consistent? Is that termination decision consistent with our other personnel practices, with our other personnel procedures? And finally, 
from time to time we need to look back and, and note the gender and race of those individuals that we're terminating for cause. And when I say terminating for cause, I'm not talking about those that resigned. Those are voluntary terminations. I'm talking about the involuntary terminations to see if there's a disproportionate number of uh, women or minorities that we're terminating for cause. That's something that the Department of Labor would look at. And again, if you need some help with that type of audit, with that type of review, partners have resources that can help you. We don't have time to touch on each one of these employment laws listed on the screen. As you can see, there are plenty that we need to be aware of. And let me, uh, let me emphasize that the burden of awareness and the burden of, of compliance is on the employer. It's not on the federal government to come tell you what laws are out there. It's up to us as employers to know what the laws are and to comply with those laws. I want to highlight a few laws out there. We've talked several times about the Federal Labor Standards Act. Uh, that's kind of an all-encompassing one that talks about minimum wage, it talks about overtime, talks about the employee status, exempt, non-exempt, individual contributor. If you have more than 100 employees in your organization, there is a report due underneath that act every September the 30th, which is called an EEO-1 report. Only those employers with over 100 employees uh, are required to file that with the Department of Labor. If you do have more than 100 employees, that form can be downloaded on the, off the DOL.gov website. And it, it's, uh, you just classify people based on their race and gender and, and, and send that in to the Department of Labor. But that is due uh, very shortly if you're in that category. Another uh, um, act that has been enhanced a bit from, uh, is the COBRA. COBRA a law which is around continuing medical benefits. Once someone leaves your organization, they have the right to continue their medical benefits based on certain circumstances on your plan, on your group plan, and we have to notify them of that. We are responsible, too, for collecting those premiums. Uh, this has been enhanced a bit under what we know as Obamacare, the ACA Act, uh, which, is, which is ramping up. So that's something else to check with your vendor that administrates your COBRA uh, notifications and your COBRA uh, benefits uh, regarding updating that with the ACA or what we know as Obamacare. I'll mention uh, a couple more. One is the ERISA Act. This, is, this has to do with retirement plans. If your organization has some type of thrift plan, value plan, 401k, 403b, any type of retirement plan that are out there, you're required to uh, annually file a Form 5500. It's called a Form 5500. Uh, normally, your vendor, whoever administrates that retirement plan for you, will complete that uh, Form 5500. They will send it to you for your review and your signature. The company will have to, uh, to execute that and file that. The vendor cannot do that for you. The uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, if you have 15 or more employees, you're covered underneath that act. Simply what that says is that you're required to make a reasonable accommodation. Again, I'll say a reasonable accommodation. Uh, and that's the key word for any disabled individual. Uh, and that, again, falls back underneath that test or that rule of reasonable. This would it be reasonable to spend $100 to make the environment uh, adapted to that person's disability, the answer to that would probably be yes, it would, but would, it, would you be required to build an additional building just because of some allergies or something that individual has? Uh, probably not. Um, I want to cover one more that kind of sneaks, uh, uh, sneaks past us at time, and that's about two-thirds of the way down that slide is FMLA, that's the Family Medical Leave Act. If you have 50 or more employees in a 75-mile radius, again, this is 50 or more in a 75-mile radius. So if you have multiple sites within a 75-mile radius, you would add up all the employees at those sites. If it's 50 or more, you'd, you'd be required to have an FMLA policy. What that FMLA policy uh, act does is it requires the employer, based on certain qualifying events, 
for example, the birth or adoption of a child, a serious medical condition of that individual, or even a serious medical condition of a family member that they need to care for, they could take up to 12 weeks of unpaid, again, I'll stress the word unpaid leave during a 12-month period. So that can be significant impact on the business if you lose someone for, say, three months. And you'd also be required, once they come back to work, to put them back into the same or similar position. You don't have to necessarily hold that job for them, but you will need to put them, give them the option to come back in either a same or similar position. So that's one that kind of gets by some of us. Uh, so watch how many employees you have. If it's 50 or more employees in the 75-mile radius, then you, you would be uh, required to follow the FMLA. You can see, again, there's a lot of employment laws that are out there. Some that we need to be a little more cautious to than others. We're not, we don't have time to go through each of them. If you see something out there that you're concerned with, please check with your uh, legal resources or you're welcome, again, to call Partners HR and, and let us uh, help you kind of sort through that. We had a question earlier about record keeping. Uh, here's a few points around that and some, and some questions to check yourself and your organization with around personnel files, we should be maintaining a personnel file. That personnel file should not have I-9s in that. I-9 should be kept in a separate file along with separate files for medical records on individuals. Medical records need to be contained in a confidential spot. One of the laws that were on the previous slide was the HIPAA law, which guarantees confidentiality around medical conditions. So if you have a medical benefits form that you have individuals enroll with, that would not go in the personnel file, but rather that would go in the in that medical file under that uh, employees. So you, you think about it, there'd be about there'd be three files where that individual would have documentation. The first would be their I-9, the second would be their actual personnel file. Examples there would be applications, any type of, of performance reviews, any type of disciplinary process, and then the third file would be for the medical records. Those need to be kept separately, and again, those need to be uh, uh, under lock and key. Uh, even electronic files um, uh, should be kept separate. Um, and and again, I would I would caution you that the people that have access to those files, the people that have access to those files, would um, need to be kind of in a need-to-know position only. From time to time, there is a need to know. You should have a designated individual that would have access to those files and could answer the questions of any managers. But the good rule to follow there is just is a need-to-know situation. Um, let's talk about storage for just a minute, the status of employee terminations. Uh, how do we store that information? That would be stored. Uh, for up to five years, up to five years for individuals that leave our organization, in, depending any action that may come come about. Uh, Is, is the purpose of that. If one is not uh, even aware, for example, a hiring manager is not necessarily aware of a person's nationality or heritage or, or origin, then it's impossible for them to discriminate against them. So keeping that separate, um, if that manager at some point in time during the life cycle of that employee uh, wants to review their file, that would, they, that would not be in there, so they wouldn't even have exposure to that. Let me give you an example of that. Um, I was dealing actually with a client earlier today on an I-9 and uh, self-identification for an affirmative action plan, and the individual identified themselves as a Native American. But when you look at that individual, you could, I could not tell, nor could the HR manager there tell that they were a Native American in any way. 
So if someone in your organization had something against Native Americans and they saw that I-9 form, they would learn that information probably for the first time. So it's really a safeguard against any discriminatory practices that you managers may be exposed to. Good question there on the I-9. Just to piggyback on, on that, Kyle, too, from a payroll perspective, it's probably the most important document that we deal with when we're dealing with an, any employee, a new hire, or termination, making sure that that we're respecting the privacy and keeping that separated and secure. Thanks, yes. Yeah, it's, it's really around that, that privacy act, that privacy act. But it can play in several different ways, play out, so to say, in several different ways if there's that information is shared. Other questions on record keeping? Okay. Uh, we've talked a little bit about reaching out to Partners HR, just to, to mention that a little bit more for clarification. We have processes, HR assessments that we can help you with. We have safety assessments that we can help your organization with. And what basically that is, is we come in, do a check on the current state, meaning we evaluate the current policies, those for example, and improve efficiencies and make comprehensive or as specific as you like, just depends on the constraints you have with staff. Half time with budgets and we have some uh, and we could sure give you some information on what that looks like. We're approaching the end of our session. And the uh, you may have a phone or simply talk. Our, again, if you'd like a copy of this presentation. You're welcome at partnershr.com. If you'd like to copy this presentation, or if you just wait, don't hesitate to contact uh, any of us. Well, thank everybody again for coming and let you know. Of some of our upcoming events, uh, and we will have uh, three more after that. That one in October, November, December. Uh, you can go to www.partnershr.com, go to the webinar tab at the top uh, right of the website, and it can take you to that webinar area. We appreciate you attending today.